Hello, welcome back. We have been saying that we should tell the students that they have to pay attention to how they solve problems manually and we should help them in translating their descriptions of manual computation into a computer program. We have been doing this with several examples and we are going to continue with more examples. So the next example is deciding whether a given sequence of parentheses is balanced. Now this example is covered in the data structures course and an O of n time algorithm is given. We are not so worried about getting the best algorithm over here because the O of n time algorithm is clever. Our question that we want to answer over here is, can the student solve the problem manually and if so, can they translate? How do they translate that solution to a computer program? Can they do that? Can we help them do that? Okay. Okay. So when I pose the problem in class, I usually don't get a quick response. So I have done this and I didn't get a quick response. Okay. So what did I do? I went to the board and I said, look, I have, I'm going to give you something like this, a sequence of parentheses. Maybe they could include also braces and brackets, whatever it is. And you have to write a program to tell me whether this is a balanced parenthesis or not. Well, ideally we should explain what balanced parenthesis is. But we don't really need to because students have been studying parentheses since standard 5 and they know what balancing parenthesis means. Okay. okay, so they don't give a response when the problem is posed first. So then you ask, okay, take an example and ask the student, do you know, can you tell me whether this example is balanced or not? So obviously students will say, yes, I know how to solve problem, tell you whether the parentheses are balanced or not. Okay, and how do I do that? So here is possibly a typical response. A student might say, <clears throat> I look for an open close pair and I erase it because I know that if something that contains an open close pair, adjacent open close pair uh, is balanced and it is balanced if and only if what remains is also balanced. Or how do I generate a set of uh, balanced parentheses? Well, I take one set of balanced, balanced parentheses and anywhere I want, I can insert an adjacent pair of balanced parentheses. So students have this insight, that is how they are actually solving the problem if you give it to them. What we are trying to get at is, we are trying to help them to realize what it is that they already know. Okay, so that is really the key over here. They know how to do things, but they have not really thought about how they know. And we want them to be aware and we want them to articulate how exactly they are doing things. Second step, they should know that they are doing this and now we should tell them what does it mean to do it on a computer. So on a blackboard things are easy. I find balanced parenthesis, so this is a balanced parenthesis, I am going to erase it. Well, on a blackboard I can use a duster and just remove that chalk mark. But that's okay. So what I'll be left with is something like this with a space in between. Now things get a little complicated that once you erase something, what does it mean to say you look for adjacent open and closed parenthesis? Okay, so you have to amend your definition a little bit and you have to say that when I say I'm looking for open closed pair, adjacent open closed pair, I'm allowing spaces to be in between the opening parenthesis and the closed parenthesis. Okay? So now you have to think about and you have to tell the student what does that mean? I'm going to use an index to first look for 
an array element containing an open parenthesis. After that, I want to increment my index and look for a closed parenthesis. But if I get a space, then I am going to ignore it. Okay. So, we are really telling the student the equivalent of what they are thinking when they are working on the board and they are confident and they are very, very comfortable with working on the board. So, we want to transfer that confidence and that comfort level to what they do when they are programming. Now, if you do this, students will be able to write the program. It will take n squared time because they will go over the same array element several times okay? because, because they may go back and forth to find uh, adjacent uh, open and closed pairs. But that is okay. I mean, we should be celebrating at this point because students are able to solve something in the first programming course which most of us think that they can only solve in the second programming course, which we teach them in the second programming course. So, what we are doing is we are helping the student a lot. We are giving the student confidence, we are telling them how to translate their manual knowledge and we are persuading them that their manual knowledge is not useless. In fact, their manual knowledge is the only thing that they have and that is what they have to work with and it is really great. That is what we are persuading them. Now, as I said earlier, what is a sequence of balanced parentheses? Well, it really needs a recursive definition. So, this could be a motivation for teaching recursion in the course. Okay? So, we will come to that a little bit later on. My next example is the 8 queens problem. So, what is this problem? Well, this problem has been discussed by Niklaus Wirth, who is another luminaries another uh, forefather, so to say, of computer science or computer programming. He wrote a celebrated paper on stepwise refinement as long ago as 1971, addressing some of the problems that we are talking about. How do you design programs? What is stepwise refinement? It is meant to be a general algorithm design strategy. Okay? And it says that if I want to write a program, I need to decompose the big task of writing a program into smaller tasks. The second principle or the second way of uh, designing programs is to think of the program as a sequence of steps in which the specifications get refined rather than thinking of the program as doing small tasks one at a time. He says that you can think of the programs, the program as a sequence of steps in which the specifications are getting refined. And what is the specification? the conditions that must be satisfied by the output. So, initially I might have I might have said that look this is my output, but it does not satisfy all conditions. So, I look at what conditions I need to satisfy and I try to get the output, I modify the output or I modify the variable which I am going to output and make that variable satisfy more and more conditions. And the moment I satisfy all the conditions, I can print out the answer. So, I can think of algorithm design or problem solving as I have a big task to do and I break it up into small tasks, but often I can think of my big task as satisfying a sequence of constraints and I am just going to get my program to satisfy more and more constraints. Okay, so, refinement means as program executes, more conditions are satisfied. Okay, so, the problem that Nikolaus Wirth considered was the 8 queens problem, which is that on a standard 8 by 8 chess board, we want to place 8 queens such that no queen captures each other. Okay, so, how does that work? Well, if you know what a chess board is, you probably know this problem already. I am going to draw a small chess board. And I am going to tell you what capture means just so that you answer, understand the problem in case 
you don't know this. You don't know queens and you don't know chess. Okay, so if I have a queen placed over here, then the queen is set to capture everything in its column. So everything that is north, and, north or south of it directly, everything that is east or west of it directly, everything that is say in the northeast direction or the southwest direction or the northwest direction as well as the southwest direction. Okay? So, if there is anything over here that will be captured. So, if I place a queen over here, I cannot place a queen over here or here or in these squares or in these squares. Okay? So, two queens capture each other if one is exactly at one of the eight compass directions with respect to the other. Okay? So, we want eight queens to be placed on an eight by eight chess chessboard so that no queens capture each other. Now, why 8? Well, in any single row, obviously, there can be only 1 in every. So, therefore, you cannot place more than 8 and therefore, the idea is see if you can place all 8. Is there a way to place all 8? Okay. So, what is needed for solving this problem? Well, we need a representation for placing queens and we need an algorithm for a non-capturing placement. So, we are finding one more difference between real life problem solving or manual problem solving and computer problem solving. So, the real life problem may deal with problems which are given to you on the board or it may deal with physical objects, objects such as a chessboard and queens. What we need to do is ask first what is the computer equivalent or we need to find a way of representing the chessboard and the queens or more directly what is a queen placement? Do we have a way of representing queens placements? So, that is the first part and then the second part is do we have an algorithm for finding all the non-capturing placements? Okay. Before we come to the our recommendation, let us go in the direction that Niklaus Wirth went. So, Niklaus Wirth says that the natural representation of the solution is 64 bits. Why? Well, there are 64 squares and we have we will use one bit to specify whether a given square contains a queen or not. So, if I give you a sequence of 64 bits, you will know exactly which squares are to contain a queen and which squares are not to contain a queen. So, that way that is the way how I can give you my solution to you. Then he says that there is a better representation. Instead of me giving you 64 bits, I can just give you 8 integers. Okay? So, the ith integer gives the row position of the queen in the ith column. Okay? I have one integer per column and that integer tells me where that queen is. So, just to clarify, this might be, this is what might, what I might have. So, I might have a queen placed over here, a queen placed over here, a queen placed over here and a queen placed over here. So, to represent this queen placement, I might write down the string of numbers 3, 1, 4, 2. So, this is for a 4 by 4 board. So, I'm, I will be giving you 4 integers and from this you would be able to know that what I mean is that the queen should be placed over here, here, here and here. Okay? So, similarly we can do something for 8. Incidentally, you might see that this, these four queens are placed so that they do not capture each other. So, this would be a solution to the 4 by 4 problem. Okay, now, the 8 integer representation is better because well, first of all it has fewer, fewer uh, items to deal with. It is indeed better, but how do we get it? 
why do we decide in favor of 8? How, do, how did we even think of 8 integers in the first place? 64 bits is natural, right? The question says we want to place a queen possibly in each square, so think of 64 bits. So think of a bit per, uh, think of a bit per square, so 64 bits. But why 8 integers? This requires a little bit of thought. And as Worth says, it is an insight. But if the students had taken a physical board and tried placing actual queens, they would immediately discover that we can never place two queens in the same column. And therefore, we don't really need eight bits per column. We just have to say where the queen in the first column is going to be, where the queen in the second column is going to be. And therefore, this better representation might have been discovered by our students just by manual work, just because they are working with things manually. Okay? Another point to be noted in this example is that Word derives the backtracking solution from scratch. Okay? So, what is, the, so what is the solution, the final algorithm that given by Word? Word says place the first queen place the second queen, check if it is being captured by the previous queen, if not go to the next possible position. So do it until you are unable to place a certain queen. So if you are unable to place the fifth queen, then go back and take the, use the next position in which you can place the fourth queen and you carry on in this manner. Now, this is the so-called backtracking solution. Okay. People might actually be teaching this backtracking solution typically in the third year, okay. not, not really in the first year. So it is somewhat complicated. So if you really, so the, the question is, you certainly, the point is that you certainly cannot expect students to uh, derive or to invent this solution. Okay? And because it is taught typically in an AI course, artificial intelligence course, in some later semesters, we can agree that it is not an easy thing. Okay. Well, so what should you do then? So backtracking solution is quite hard to derive. Okay, but it is not that difficult if you relate it to prior training. What do I mean by that? Well, students have been taught permutations and combinations in mathematics courses. So how do you generate permutations of five numbers or five people in five chairs? Okay. So, that kind of thing people have been taught. So what you should be saying over here is all possible ways of placing queens is really all possible permutations of 8 integers or the integers 1 through 8. Because if you come back to this solution, what is this? We know that in this sequence each number between 1 and 4 is going to appear exactly once and all possible numbers are potentially candidate positions for placing queens. They may not give you non-capturing queen positions, but they will give you candidates which you need to consider. So, in the eight queens problem, you really want all possible permutations. So, in 11th and 12th mathematics, you actually have done this problem of generating all possible permutations. So, go back to that and relate to what they already know or what they already know manually. And from that, if you want, you can derive the solution to the eight queens problem. Okay? So the points to be noted, Word does not suggest that first solve manually. Word directly jumps into writing a computer program. So we were saying whether this strategy of first solving manually is obvious or not. Evidently, it is not obvious. Word does not use that strategy. 
But we feel that even in this case, solving manually would have helped a great deal. Okay. And we want to point out that it is useful to build on what students already know. So students have facility with working with a physical board, so use that facility. It's kind of, what is it called, uh, kinesthetic, uh, some kind of uh, thinking through your body. Okay? So, uh, uh, it is, it, so it is useful to build on what students already know, what they know how to do, okay? and also to refer to their math knowledge of permutations which is immediately relevant over here. So students have studied permutations, so you can build upon that. And stepwise refinement that Worth points out is important and we are going to study it later on, we are going to build upon it later on. But we feel that really coming back to our theme, solving manually is a good idea. And when we solve manually, there are equivalents. So what does it mean to go to the next position? So all those equivalences between advancing queens on a physical chessboard and doing the same thing on, uh, in an array can be discussed and should be discussed, especially if you are finding that some of your students are struggling with it. But for struggling students, you certainly should say, look, tell me how would you solve the problem manually? Because that is the domain where students are actually very comfortable. Okay, so I am going to summarize uh, the content of this lecture. So manual computation and translation from it, what have we learned or what can we take away? So the first point to be noted and I cannot emphasize this more, get students to introspect and precisely state how they solve problems. Encourage giving names to values they compute. For example, they might say SI is equal to the sum in iteration. SI is not a variable. Okay. It is just a name given to a value for ease of future reference. We want to encourage students to do parameterization. So if there are n rows, that n should somehow come into your description. Then the second point is, we should teach the incremental skill needed to translate the precise description of manual computation into a computer program. Okay. So what does it mean to make a list? What does it mean to find the next closing parenthesis which is adjacent to an opening parenthesis? What if there are spaces in between? Okay, well, in your computer program you will have code which will help you skip over the, over the spaces. We have to explicitly teach how to design variables, manual operations, uh, how to translate them. Okay. Then we have to clarify to students that a computer program does not see everything a glance, but can look at the data only through a small window. Okay. All right, so that ends the current lecture. In the next lecture, we are going to address the question of should we teach students manual program solving strategies? So we will take that in the next lecture. Thank you.